Hey, what's up? This is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints, and I am super excited to bring you my interview with Marvin Bendeley. He is the director of Food Waste Texas. I'm going to keep this intro very, very short because this is the longest interview I've done because there's two parts. I interviewed him in September, and I wanted to get his backstory as well as the early days of Food Waste Texas and then get into Camp Brisket and Barbecue Summer Camp and the symposiums. And our time got cut short, so we decided we're going to do a part two. And then part two was three months later in December. So there's a ton of information. Things have changed because of COVID. Things have got put off. So if you want to know about the lottery system, things have changed for that. So if you're a fifth year person on that list, if you've been a member of Food Waste Texas and trying for five years, you're automatically in. So there's a lot of cool stuff for that. So we talk about all the way different ways to get in and about Camp Brisket and Barbecue Summer Camp. Then we talk about the symposiums and the wine event. And then there's virtual things coming up. And it's just chock full of tons and tons of information. If you want to get to the newer portion, you could jump 45 minutes to... 50 minutes ahead and you could see when uh, our clothes change and the setting changes not for me i always have this stupid thatch thing but for marvin it changes uh, you could do that but i would listen to the beginning because you learn a lot about food ways and about marvin i can't thank him enough for taking the time you're really going to enjoy this and thank you for listening and the kevin's barbecue joints podcast and youtube show is brought to you by centex smokers they're on instagram at c-e-n-t-e-x underscore smokers that's at Centex underscore smokers. They're about four to five months lead time right now. Michael's doing great stuff. Check them out. Follow them. Centex smokers out of Luling, Texas. And we're brought to you by Treaty Oak Distilling out of Dripping Springs, Texas. They're at treatyoakdistilling.com. They also have a physical location you can visit in Dripping Springs. So check them out again at treatyoakdistilling.com. If you're digging these, please subscribe the bell notification that way you don't miss out i have a big backlog so there's a lot of cool stuff coming out i have a website at kevinsbbqjoints.com but at the end stay safe hope you're doing okay and enjoy this i, I want to piece all the, the puzzle pieces together if i can and give people an idea and also with food ways i i, I want to keep not beating into people's heads but give them an understanding of what it means and what it is and and then also your book is your book book is still available I was, I was gonna buy it on amazon and it said it was gonna come like a week later so i figured i'd get it after i talked to you are you talking about republic of barbecue yeah, republic, i know you no. it was a, com, a compilation of a few people right Isn't yeah it? yeah and that's it's crazy that it's already over 10 years old now yeah isn't that um, amazing when we were doing that you know it started it with a grad student class with Elizabeth Engelhardt, I was still in graduate school. Oh. She was the professor, and the whole point of the class was just to, you know, sort of understand local culture through food. And we chose to do oral histories, interviews with barbecue, not just restaurants, people, you know, that were in the industry mm -hmm. within about a two hour radius of Austin. But that was just going to be the class, and we were going to give all the, uh, the uh, interviews to the Southern Foodways Alliance because they had a, a pretty robust. Yeah. oral history program going on at the, at that time and it just it turned into something much bigger so we, we all end up working on that thing for about two two years or so when really it was only we were only supposed to have a semester of doing some <laughs> interviews so but it was because it was fun right it was you were enjoying it oh right? yeah i mean it's why i'm doing what i'm doing i enjoyed it so much so it, it but it was definitely a collaboration of you know elizabeth Engelhart, who was basically the editor and then about i think 12 or so 13 graduate students so oh. and i wrote a couple of little essays for it and then interviewed some folks too so yeah it was a blast i enjoyed it it's obviously it's dated but it's not dated because it's still like a snapshot of that time it's it's well so one of the things we were trying to do is create a method for scholars to study food culture okay you know and and uh and then and then put that out i mean so it's sort of a a combination between a coffee table book and a scholarly, I guess, you know, pretty well researched book, you know, yeah. so, but yeah, it is, it's dated in that when we did that, you know, Franklin had just started, uh -huh. right? So this, the new, the sort of new, uh, you know, I think uh, John Mueller was, had he his place had already gone under. The place on Manor uh, Road, on, right? It was gone yeah, under. the place on Manor Road, you know, but that was, he, he was sort of the bringing that back to Austin. He was kind of the first mm -hmm. salvo there. And then, then Franklin took it up after that. And we were not in that mode at all. You know, we were talking about, you know, Louis Miller, which is still, you know, who's changed with the times and, and kept up. But, you know, that was when, that was when Wayne's dad was still running. Yeah, Wayne it. wasn't there, right? It was, it was no, Fred Fontaine there. probably, right? Yeah. 
but you know we were out at in uh, Lockhart you know we went out to Lockhart we we, we were in uh, Taylor and outside of Austin. there were a couple places in Austin we interviewed but it was mostly outside you know and probably so, Elgin like that place is in Elgin right they were probably yeah there. yeah totally yeah. yeah yeah Brian Bracewell and and at uh, at uh, Southside and Greg and, over, yeah, I would. Yeah, well, and you know, since then we've we've been doing lots of other. I mean, not just not just for barbecue folks, but yeah. Food Waste Texas started up a couple of years later. My house is under construction, so this is a rental. So we we uh, <laughs> okay. yeah, this is a, a professor from UT decided to go to Germany and okay. he needed somebody to take their house. So we were like, yeah, we'll do it. So we're here for the end till the end of uh, December. He went to Germany uh, during COVID or right before COVID. So it, it's a it's kind of a long story. I'll tell it to, to you though. But the, UT has an exchange program with France with okay. some some uh, I think the Sorbonne, and wow. one of our really good friends is an American Studies professor at the Sorbonne. And he, they wanted to come to Austin. It's my wife's really close friend from college and her husband. And uh, so they switched with these guys and they went to France and our friends came here and then COVID hit three months later. So, our, you know, we hadn't seen our friends in a long time and then they're here for a couple months and then we can't see them and they're just down the road, you know? <laughs> oh, wow. uh, so they, they uh, the, the other professor ended up deciding because COVID happened to stay out of Austin. So I think they have family somewhere in like Pennsylvania or something like that. And, okay. and then the, he's originally from Germany. So they were over there at some point too. And they were, they just said to our friends, do y'all know somebody who could take this? Cause we don't want to come back anytime soon. And, and our house was, we were about to move out. So it worked out perfect. So yeah, I have no idea what, who that is. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a unique, it's unique. And it's like, it's probably some funky artist or it's not maybe. <laughs> I really can't even read the name on it. There, there's somebody, there's somebody on it, but uh, okay, okay. it's, they have this kind of stuff like all throughout. Yeah, there's that, that one there on, above me. Oh, and funny. then there's another one over there. And then in some of the other rooms, they have, they have a nice uh, artistic, uh, I guess, touch to this place yeah, yeah. doesn't yeah. our house is not like that at all i think my kids would destroy everything so well this would be cool too this is like a time capsule for you in like 10 years if you look back hopefully youtube and everything will exist still you can look yeah. at this and see that wow that was that weird house that uh, we stayed at the cool, <laughs> the, the cool house with the weird art where did you grow up i grew up in south texas um i i lived in a bunch of different places around this small town called divine it's spelled d-e-v-i-n-e okay and uh it just a uh town of about 4,000 people, not even, it wasn't even 4,000 when I was living there, but it's about 30 miles southwest of San Antonio. Okay. South, southwest, going towards Laredo on I-35, so almost directly south. And then, so yeah, I lived there all my life. Living there, would you go out to Big Bend? Is that like... I, I did when I was little with my parents and mm -hmm. stuff. I haven't been there in years, but uh, we would usually go to, to uh, Concan every summer. Huh. Um, where the Frio River is, um, that's where Garner State Park is, oh, okay. although we never went to the state park. There was a bunch of other places. And we'd swim there in the summer instead of going down to swim in the Rio Grande, which wasn't quite as nice. <laughs> um, but the, well, it, you know, the, 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 the Frio is cold and clear, so it's kind of fun to swim in. So, yeah, we would do that. But I lived there all my life. It's a farming community, so there's at southwest of, of San Antonio, uh, back in the like 1911, some some developers came out there and built a dam on the Medina River oh. and basically uh, turned that whole area into a irrigated community. Hmm. It's I mean hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres. Um, and then the guy that developed it uh, was was going to during World War the beginning of World War One was heading heading to uh, Great Britain I think on the Lusitania the wow. The, the, it got sunk. The whole thing kind of sunk after that, you know. They it, but they finished it. It just yeah, it didn't literally go into like the twenties. Yeah. So yeah, my my uh, mom's grandpa or my, yeah my mom's grandfather and his family came down from Oklahoma because there was an irrigated community they could buy land and start farming. But my dad, cool. his side, they had been in Castroville, which is you know ten fifteen minutes away from where I grew up, um, west of west of San Antonio on on ninety. They he they settled that place so in the eighteen late eighteen forties so they've been there since then. Wow! And in fact, in fact, my mom and dad live on the home place from that they've had since the eighteen fifties now. What part of it? Wow! Yeah, that's it was really about neat. a thousand acres at one point, and now I think they there were ten kids at one one point. And they divided it up into a bunch of small pieces, and my dad, when his parents died, got a piece of that which was larger than because my grandpa had been buying up some pieces around him. 
And since then, my dad's been buying up other pieces. So he's he's put together about 200, a little over 200 acres of that original land. Oh, really? And now my brother is actually going to buy a piece down the road from them that is still part of that land. So we'll have we'll have about 300 acres in the family of that original over 1,000 acres. Is it farmland? Oh, it's, it's yeah. I mean, it, the, the road that they live on dead ends about uh, 50 yards past his gate. And it's, there's no, so there's no connector road that goes up to 290, I mean, to one night, uh, to 90, Highway 90. And uh, it's, it's pretty, there's more people out there than there used to be. But when I'd go out there every Sunday to visit my grand, grandparents, I mean, there was nobody out there. It was like one or two people. They had party line phones still. So you, you'd only answer it if, it, if, you know, with the number of rings that was your, your designated number. Oh, that's what a, uh, that's a throw. I don't think anybody that's like born after like 1985 or 90 would even. I mean, when my mom and dad got together, which would have been the late sixties, mm -hmm. my grandparents just had gotten indoor plumbing. They still had an outhouse out there. Wow. Um, so it's, yeah, it's way out. And, and dad and, and his, his, uh, brothers and sisters grew up farming, but also hunting. Like even, and, and year round, they didn't really. I think there's no. I think the statute of limitations is probably passed on this, but I mean, he would hunt in the summer when they needed food. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, they, that's what they did. And they, he remembers, he remembers, uh, you know, processing whole hogs in the in the late fall, early winter to put away for the for the winter. You know, and wow. you know, doing the whole scalding and scraping. And they had chickens and cattle and pigs all the time. So I remember collecting eggs for my grandma. You know, stuff like that. What do you think that did for you growing up like that? Do you think it gave you an appreciation for things or a different view of things? I'll tell you this. The thing I think it did most for me is uh, just that kind of mode of growing up. Because on, on my mom's side, it's a little bit different. They were, they're more, they, they still came from, we're in a small town, but it was a little more, um, I mean, they, they were more ingrained in the sort of the, the modern technologies and things that were happening. And I think what it did for me more than anything, I mean, I definitely have appreciation and I hunt constantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, every year we go hunting with my dad. I mean, that's one of the kind of uh, rituals that we have to, you know, stay connected. But we do. So we do that, my brother and my brother-in-law every year. But I think the thing it did for me most of all is, I mean, they can just solve problems on yeah. their own. That's nice. You know, they always did. And, and they were self-sufficient. And and I think that's probably if there is a lesson passed down from that from my grandpa to my dad and, and grandma and, and that's probably what it was. I can pretty much handle any situation, you know, and, and you know, just solve it eventually and that's the way it's always been. But still that's a great that's a great skill to have because I think a lot of people are so dependent on others or they, they, they don't problem solve. And, you know, it, I, I find myself that's happening more and more to me too, because we do rely so much on computers yeah. technology in me. general that you know you and you can you can google anything now so it's there's no looking it up it is amazing it yes <laughs> yeah like yeah like you're like how do i do this and you just youtube it and you're like oh six other people yeah. know how to do it better than yeah in fact yeah, i'm in part of the house uh we're working on i'm trying to find a unfortunately not a standard size not a cutting board what they call it, butcher block mm -hmm. for for an island that we're putting in and uh, can't find it so i was talking to my brother and he was like oh man i watched a youtube video on that the other day <laughs> i if we can get the proper tools i could build one for you and i was like i think it's a little more than just watching a youtube video <laughs> man <laughs> so what did he want to take a bunch of wood and then i have no idea i don't know how to do it he i mean he's pretty handy he probably could do it but i, I don't think i would want to be the test subject for him yeah because uh, especially like so. it's a surface you don't want to clamp like there are gonna be problems and you know it probably takes six months instead of you know what it should <laughs> a couple few weeks or whatever usually so, so at the end of this anyway. year do you move back to that place yeah it's almost finished i mean it this is a i, I wouldn't recommend doing this for anybody, um, it was such a pain in the butt, especially in Austin. We it took forever to get permits, actually around trees, which I understand. I want the trees to stay alive too, but it was just some of it was just really frustrating. And then, and then we had a long process with the with the architect, and we didn't. It's not like we did much. It was a tiny house. It was we had 800 square feet with two kids and two dogs, you know. <laughs> so I had to have, I had to have another room. So it oh. just it, it's been two years of planning and getting it all together and finally probably at the end of this month we'll move back in so oh, that's nice that'll be yeah that'll yeah. be really nice no it's it's it it's like that here in los angeles too i think it depends on how how intertwined the bureaucracy is and things go get a little nuts i totally understand it i'm i'm totally a, I'm, I'm a you, we need taxes guy you know i'm i'm fully on board with that stuff 
sometimes it can be a little more streamlined than it actually is, mm-hmm. though, I think. And, you know, you sit from the outside, you look in, you're like, why can't you do it this way? Mm-hmm. Um, but it is what it is. And a lot of those things, too, a lot of these regulations or things are built in because people do things on their own and then uh, people die or people like there's there's like everybody's like, why does it? Well, it's because, you know, some guy. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there, there's typically a reason for it. Right. But yeah, yeah. It, 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 what happens is it becomes this uh, this whatever regulation that covers so much broadly and it does it and all that stuff doesn't fit right mm-hmm. so anyway how did you meander out of that area to did you get to because of college yeah, well yeah so I, I played football in high school and i was fairly good for the area i think and i ended up getting a scholarship to the air force academy to play oh. up there so i i went and i chose instead to go to the they have a prep school where you can play a year and decide if that's what you really want to do because i was pretty skeptical about the military. Mm-hmm. My dad was in the in the Air Force Reserves or the National Guard for, I mean, I think he he ended up being a the highest master sergeant you can get, and then retired after 40 years or something like that. So oh, wow. there was some of that some of that pushing, and I went and played and did really well, and and then I got hurt and realized that's the only reason I'm there because I hated everything else about it. <laughs> that's funny. So uh, so I left. That happens. Uh, and I realized, you know, I, I didn't have the size to play anywhere else. And it wasn't as much fun as it was in high school. So I did that. And then I, uh, after that, I kind of floated around. I worked in uh, insurance for a while for State Farm for a couple of agents and came to Austin in 95 to follow a girl and uh, <laughs> and would take, I took classes at ACC and I always had really good grades in high school and, and pretty much got in to all the schools. But after, when I first started college I was not ready and didn't do very well in, in some things and uh, partied a little bit too much in Austin you know when you're 22 in the mid 90s uh, it was fun it's like perfect yeah. <laughs> that's a, a perfect story yeah. and I had, a, I had a really close friend that was living here too so we, we had a blast and eventually I just sort of started getting burned out on on that stuff and decided I want to go back to school so I applied to schools I wanted to go to and got in at Tulane in, in New Orleans so that's where I went to undergrad oh. How was that? Much later. I was 24, I think, when I got there, and I was uh, a sophomore, I think. So I was older than everybody, except for my roommates, who were all um, coming back from the military to go to ROTC so they become they could become officers. So they put me in this five-bedroom apartment on campus, uh-huh. and I just walked. I had no idea. All these guys were my age, so it, it worked <laughs> out perfect. really well. That's so perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get an appreciation for food when you lived there? Um, well, just because it's such a great food city. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I totally did. And, but not in the same way. Like I wasn't thinking about studying it, you know, or doing field work, you know, um, I was, when I came to, even when I came to UT grad school, I was already a couple years after my, my undergraduate, I was still the thinking I would be talking about, you know, doing stuff with religion and oh. culture. So I was really interested in not, not that I'm in, not as a religious person, but as sort of an outside looking, I grew up Catholic. So I was always interested in some of that, but I never really like I never really fell in line, I guess, with it. But uh, so, yeah, but I was I met my wife there. She was in grad school and I was in undergrad, even though I was I'm almost five years older than she is. So <laughs> she's she's uh, she was on track. I was not. But uh, her, her this is weird. So, you know, the Southern Foodways Alliance, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the associate director at the Southern Foodways Alliance is my sister-in-law, uh, oh. Mary Beth Lassiter. Yeah. Oh, oh, so really? I, okay. Yeah, so pretty early on, through my wife Jessica, I started hearing about Southern Foodways Alliance, and I knew a little bit about it oh, okay. and thought it was pretty cool. But I still didn't participate. That really didn't happen until I took that class in grad school with Elizabeth Engelhart, and we ended up doing Republic of Barbecues when I really got into it. Did you move to? I went to. Uh, so my brother was in L.A. for. I think he graduated in 2000 from his college, and then he went out there, and he was an actor. He did commercials and. Really? And then then he ended up getting on with some post-production company and doing coloring, post-production coloring for uh, commercials and other things. And I graduated and just went out there and lived with him for a while. I worked for a, a forensic psychiatrist out there in Century City. <laughs> really? And, uh, and and then started applying to grad school. So, okay. so I, I applied to a few schools and then ended up getting into UT Austin and came back. And, and so, it's, that's a transition from Los Angeles to Austin. That's kind of 
similar but different. It's a yeah, it is. I mean, going from New Orleans to Los Angeles was like yeah, worlds apart, right? Um, but coming back to Austin, and I'd already lived here for you know five years um, before, and I still sure. had a lot of friends here, and uh, so it was a no brainer to come back once I got in. And yeah, but that transition is it's you know Austin in the mid two thousands is much more like L A than mm. than it was in the nineteen nineties. Yeah, yeah. But there's still there's still tons of difference. I mean L A is so big and spread out. You know uh, Austin it was not that, that it's starting it was starting to spread out. Now they're like making it denser in downtown, but mm. but it it was nothing like L A where you can drive for like two hours and not get away from concrete. You know, I mean it's. <laughs> <laughs> or more sometimes, you know, Austin, you can get out pretty easily yeah, unless yeah. you get stuck on I-35. But, but yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't much of a, of a transition. And, and I was already, I mean, Texas is my home, you know, so. But it's nice that you got a taste of, of Louisiana and then you got a taste of California and Los Angeles and where you live, where you said off camera, you had said Sherman Oaks, uh, uh, New, uh North Hollywood, that area, that's kind of like the hub of a lot of stuff in Los Angeles. It's right on the cusp of so much. Yeah, right. And and I would drive over the hills to Century City or sometimes actually I rode the rode the train and then buses out a lot of times too just to avoid any traffic. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah, you could walk down the streets. You you're doing when you're doing that, you're walking around and you get to see a lot of stuff that you don't typically see from a car. And Century Century City is is a lot more built up now than when you live there. There's a lot like they've it, it's it's grown so much and they've built giant malls and things it's really yeah i don't know how it is the last nine months but i worked in those two buildings that uh were modeled after the world trade center Mm -hmm. um and uh when i got there everybody was really worried that they were next in line you know for getting targeted right because it was the same architects or something and though but that was about it those two big buildings and there wasn't much else i mean there were a few other buildings but nothing major so yeah um a lot more built up I remember that that uh, you know you couldn't ride the train all the way to Century City because the big argument was they wanted to send a line out towards uh, uh, what Santa Monica mm-hmm. from Hollywood area, but you know you're going through a lot of rich areas and they had a, they had some good political clout, right? And, mm-hmm. and would, so they never got it through there. I doubt they have still. So yeah. I ended up riding the bus from Hollywood over there. They actually have they have a train now that stops they on did. on Fourth. Yeah, it's it. It just opened maybe four or five years ago, and then now they have another one that was halfway to LAX from oh, downtown. Wow. But and That's they did excellent. a they did a big party when it was halfway, and I kept thinking, "Don't party! Like, keep going. This yeah. <laughs> Yeah, finish it first. Yeah, finish that's the first. party yeah. when you're like halfway yeah. done. It's not a party. <laughs> well, that's great. That's great news. That would have been so helpful back yeah. then. As some, you know, sometimes I would just drive over the the hills, which was also kind of nice. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I I love my time out there. And it was like like you said, it wasn't a it wasn't a big tra- the biggest transition was in Austin. It's still car culture. You know, mm-hmm. there's no there's no there's no public trans. Well, there's the buses that are really great, mm-hmm. but many most people. You know, there's always this, there's been a stigma with buses for a long time and people are starting to ride them more. But, you know, back then I didn't ride them that much. I was driving. It's just so much quicker, you mm-hmm. know, and I was, all, I was usually running late as a grad student. So, yeah, no, <laughs> so and, and it's, that's how it is in a Los Angeles. No, the buses are half empty. If, if yeah, I don't know how they even are right now, but they were. So it's it's yeah, people like to have their cars in certain places. If yeah. I wish I wish like it's we're still 10 years off from a real because I live in the valley and there's no real way to get to those other trains to get to them like yeah that would be yeah. nice that would be really nice so then so so at so at ut you went to grad school there right the american studies program there um in 2005 is when i started i actually got in the year before and and uh, deferred which i've forgotten about until recently huh. when i hired I, I hired the the person that was the administrator for the department back when i got there she was running it basically and then she stopped because she was having kids and then a couple of years ago, we were looking to hire, not even last year, we were looking to hire our first actual admin person and she wanted a part-time job. So she came in and she was like, yeah, we, you know, I remember you coming in and then having to defer. And I was like, I don't remember that at all. So anyway, I was here in 2005 <laughs> and I got into the PhD program. So it, you know, it's supposed to be about seven or eight years and um, about the fifth year, six years when I got this job and 
if there's anybody out there listening that or will be listening to this that is going for a PhD, do not get a job when when you're trying to do that because it, it extended my my time probably five years. You know? oh, really? um, yeah, because I was working full time and this running a at what at first what was an outside nonprofit and then you know becoming part of the university at, at one point. It's and it was just me and a, and a well not just me we had some we had some board members that were really helpful too, but it took up most of my time. Plus I, you know the the day the the month after I got hired or before I got hired we had our first child as well. So oh. <laughs> yeah, and and I just turned in my dissertation uh, proposal. So it it tacked on a few years, yeah. but yeah. So I started in two thousand five and I ended up finishing my dissertation and, and passing everything 10 years later. So 2015. So. When you say this job, what, for people that don't know, what's the, what is this job? Uh, so my, yeah, so my main, uh, I, I'm in the American studies department at UT now, mm -hmm. and there's a convoluted story on how we got there, but I, I can tell that if you want. Yeah. But, uh, the, what the, my main job is the director of foodways, Texas, which is a, program that started outside the university as a nonprofit and and our goal was to become affiliated with a uni in a university setting like so some somewhat like the southern foodways alliance mm -hmm. and uh, eventually pretty quickly we did that with ut austin so and, and eventually i moved over to the american studies department but i mean the the what foodways texas does our main goal is preserving celebrating um uh, foodways in the state right um, and documenting it basically and getting it uh, set set in a in a archive that we you know it's a couple places we put stuff um, just so it's available to the public so our primary way of doing that is is oral history interviews um, but then we also part of the part of the educational component for our our program is to do symposia as well and yeah. then we have some some other events. The thing about Food Waste Texas is every bit of our, you know, most departments at UT have a budget set by the state and by the university. And they, you know, in September, a bunch of money magically appears in their account, right? <laughs> For us, we raise every dollar uh, outside the university and get nothing from them except the office. I mean, they give us an office and some stuff. Uh, but yeah, so we're, we're raising money. So we do some other fundraising events, a couple of those, which we are also as educational would be the barbecue camps, which is relevant more to this, this. Yeah. Podcast. And that's, so that's sort of weaving, but also yeah. I would hope that people would be interested in the whole, the whole story. Yeah. But, but. I mean, my, my favorite event honestly is the symposium because it's not, it's not one, one uh, topic. Yeah. I mean, we'll have a theme every, every time and, and it's three days of bringing in speakers and other panelists and chefs and we serve seven meals and, we don't make a dollar off of it. It's it's basically break even event for us, but it's it's a highly educational and a lot a lot of fun, um, and we move it around the state every year. The last one in San Antonio is that it's supposed to be. So we were one of the first groups to actually decide we better postpone. And and the reason that happened is because um, I don't know if you remember the earliest days of the pandemic. They they had those those cruise ships. That you know we're getting a bunch of people. Yeah, 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 that's funny. I forgot all about how. Well, that's what. So they. They took a bunch of folks off of one of those cruise ships and quarantined them in San Antonio at one of the Air Force ah, bases. Ah, okay, I remember that, yeah. And then they let one of those people leave thinking she was not infected, and then later she they, they had tested her and let her go, but then the test came back positive. And in that meantime, she had gone to one of the local malls and hung out in the food court for like two hours, oh, wow. rode a bus to her hotel, and then stayed in a hotel. So that, that came out two to three weeks ahead, maybe two weeks ahead of time. And we were like, we we're going to be there in two weeks. And at that point, the whole, the word was, you know, the, the symptoms will start showing up, you know, in 10 to 14 days or five to 14 days. And we we're like, you know, what's going to happen is mm -hmm. all these, all this is going to pop up that week and everybody's going to cancel on us. So we quickly postponed. And, uh, yeah, because that was on my calendar and I talked to a number of other people that yeah. it was on their calendar to go. And it was, and 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 it looks, we'll we'll talk a little bit more in depth about the symposiums because like, like pricing and this how so people can know for the future because this is going to happen again like you're going to have more symposiums so and then it's a is it a one is a is, is it a once a year or twice a year thing it's once a year okay. and and what we were planning to do with this one is you know we had no idea what was going to happen so the plan was let's let's reevaluate in May or or June and and try to set it for the fall and obviously that's not going to happen so what we ended up doing is just basically canceling it and 
we we're going to try to do it in March okay. or April when we would typically do it and and basically just plop that whole thing we planned down uh, back to that way. I mean, it's a t- it was supposed to be our 10 year anniversary oh. as well, but we're still going to go to San Antonio with it. But we've been talking about future uh, years. One of them we're planning to go to El Paso and then going back to some smaller areas as well, like the Valley, some places in the Valley and stuff like that. So that's a great, that's a really good idea. Instead of having it just in major places, it would be nice to bring people to an area that yeah and there are some practical reasons for that as well so we did a bunch of them in austin well three or four of them in austin i guess and we've been in dallas and houston and we're small um and in austin in the spring uh we are the small fish when it comes to uh food conferences or festivals you know there's the austin food wine festival and now uh, Franklin has a festival that he does every year. Oh, the Hot Luck, is that what it's called? Yeah, Hot Luck, yeah. Yeah, which seems great. I haven't actually been yet, but it looks awesome. Yeah, it's on my list of want to, I want to go. Yeah. <laughs> I, it, we just don't have enough money to spend on what it costs to get hotel. Because we'll pay for hotel rooms for all of our speakers. And that's a massive uh, mm-hmm. output of funds. And for our organization, it just wasn't working. San Antonio is a little bit cheaper for us, um, but mainly I mean, we wouldn't have been doing this if it wasn't we wouldn't have gone to San Antonio if it wasn't the ten year anniversary. So we'll, before that we had been in Brenham, and uh, we'll go to El Paso. But other than that, we're going to go to places that are the size of, say, Victoria, okay, and try to get out away from the major cities, which I, we think will be a benefit because, you know, people come to Austin all the time. Yeah, and you, you they're can exposed maybe, to that already. Yeah. Well, in Brenham that weekend, we were the biggest thing, you know. So, I mean, it, it's, it changes a little bit, you know. We won't have to, as much competition. It is cheaper for us, too. Yeah. So. The money in through donation is it through membership? And then also through, uh, do you have, is there, uh, what are the other revenue streams that, the, or the people can donate? Because I want to keep yeah. you guys around. Yeah, so we, we, it is a membership organization. We have about 1,500 members worldwide now. And so there's an I'm annual one. fee. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> You're an, there's an annual fee for, for for being a member. And there's several levels. So that that brings in a good bunch of our, probably about half, to okay. maybe 40% to 50% of our income is membership. Maybe not. I'd have to look back at that. It may be less than that, maybe 25% at this point. And then we do, we do uh, some events that are, sort of sponsored and and we get uh, donated funds for okay. stuff like that and we, and we we do have some sponsors occasionally we're not like the southern foodways alliance where they have some pretty long-term sponsors we don't have any relationships like that we're usually trying to get sponsors for events and things like that mm-hmm. and then the barbecue camps honestly are a pretty good source of income okay. for us because uh we don't lose money we don't break even on that we do make some and it's not just for us the the meat science section over there uh in the Department of Animal Science for Texas A&M, we split everything with them. So it's sort of a, uh, we're working together on that, right? So Is that a weird thing that it's UT and Texas A&M? I, I mean, that's the big joke every year. We, we always talk about uh, the fact that barbecue is the only thing that the two universities <laughs> will work together on. <laughs> you know, it, so, which makes sense, I think. Yeah, uh, it brings people together. It's definitely something that we, that we all have, have a fondness for. I, I grew up here in Austin, I mean, in Texas with the, the rivalry in the background all the time. And, and we, we used to call my, my high school um, Texas A&M South Campus because almost, almost everybody that graduated ended up going there because it's a farming community. Um, but I never really was... I, you know, football, I liked both teams. I, I was always more of a Texas person, you know, yeah. rooting for both of them. So I, I never really bought into that too much, you know. It's, there's, there's just so many good people on both sides. And and we really lucked into meeting, a, like, Jeff Sable and Davey Griffin, you know, all, all the guys that are working over there. Um, Ray Riley, um, they're just such good people. And it's so easy to work with them. And they do such a good job, you know. I mean, it basically... We provide some of the cultural programming, and they're they're doing all the science and cooking, and man, they just it's just it just happens, and it's easy. and And frankly, with those events, also the barbecue community in the state. I mean, there's some folks that come out there and just help for free most of the time. You know, they're volunteering, and we'll have people come in to speak, and they they're happy to do it. You know, we have never have a problem finding good people to come in and do that. So it's just fun. A lot of good people. And if you're from the outside, the, the people that come there are the biggest people in barbecue. Uh, yeah. I mean, typically, yeah, we try to get some, some headliners there, but we, we're also trying to, it's sort of hard because what, what happens with the A&M guys is they, they're, you know, they've been doing these types of things for 
decades, right? So they have a set way of doing it. And it's, it's so much better when you can get the same people to kind of work in the background because they know what they're doing, right? So what we're trying to do is get different folks from, there's so many new barbecue places yeah. and so many popular ones now. And so we're trying to get people to come in and cook a meal or be on a, a panel, right? That That's is changing smart. it up, and getting more people involved. And the problem is, you know, there's only so many spots for that each year. And it's, so it's a slow process, you know, reaching out and getting other people. And then we have some friends that come, you know, every other year or something. You know, Franklin will be there. He wasn't there last year, but he'll, I think he's yeah. supposed to come the next one. If we, we have one scheduled in January, but you know, it's possible we'll have to postpone it. Because the summer one is, is it called summer? It's summer camp or is it? Bar- barbecue summer camp. Barbecue summer camp, yeah. Yeah. And then the other one is camp brisket. Yeah. So. I always say brisket camp and it's camp brisket. Yeah. I get it wrong. Well, I think at this point when you say it, most anybody that knows what's going on knows what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, it's, We've had people from all over the world at that one. I mean, we had a guy from Kazakhstan one year. We have oh, wow. people from South America, several countries in South America, definitely Canadians, people in Europe. I mean, it's just from everywhere. It's crazy. Um, not, and then, of course, almost every state, you know. Yeah. So. And uh, yeah, and, and uh, I'm from California, and I want to come. I want to go really badly. Are they did the summer camp? That one was postponed. Then right? It's postponed. It was postponed. Still, we're we're going to do it. It's just a matter of when we can do it. So all those folks that. You know, it's it's lottery driven now um, because I, I could explain all that to you too. So all those folks that got a spot and paid for a ticket, we gave them the option of of uh, you know getting a refund or waiting to see when we set the date and then getting a refund if they can't do it, or just carrying them over to the next one. And I think we had one person that needed a refund. <laughs> Everybody else was like, "I'm not losing my spot." I'm wow, that's so that's smart. Yeah, yeah, I, I I would keep my. So we're not going to cancel one of those because there's just the demand is too high um and we need to get people through we have people that have been trying for four and five years to do it you know that have been members that long i mean it's, the loyalty is amazing and some of those folks are from other states so they don't really get to do a whole lot of the other things that we do right mm-hmm. so we're, we're, we're gonna probably end up doing two next summer okay. if we can yeah yeah that makes sense um, i mean i guess there is i don't want to i don't want to like hold myself you know, make, make everybody hold me to something but it, I guess if it this continues into the summer, it's possible we have to cancel the one we haven't done anything for, or or just give people a, a certificate for the next time. So yeah. we might have to lose one of them, right? But we're hoping that's not the case, and we can do two this summer, one last year's and this year's. So. Oh, and then of course you know Camp Brisket is set right now, and all those folks have tickets and are you know ready to go. It's possible we have to postpone that one too, depending. I mean, we're sort of beholden to Texas A&M as well because we're on their property. Mm. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, at this point, we, you know, I'm not, I, we're probably not going to do it at this point. If something clears up major in the next month or so, yeah. we might consider ways to do it. But it's just really hard because we're on a classroom and we fill that sucker. And then they go back in the cooler. Yeah, it's and a lot they're of all around each other, you know. Mm. So I don't think we could safely do it the way we would want to do it. So we may have to postpone that one too and do two of those the next time as well. So. <laughs> so it's it's all up in the air, but it's it for people. So say if you're listening to this in the fall of 2020, uh, Camp Brisket or Brisket Camp has been, uh, has already been taken, has already, like, so yeah. is it, so I'm trying to think of when, when I, was it uh, two months ago that we, that we were in the lottery or how, I'm trying to yeah, think of how yeah. long so ago. I'll, I'll uh, yeah. So the story behind that is we, when we decided to do this, gosh, man, it was in 2010, maybe like November, this guy named Rob Walsh, who's a food writer, yeah. um, he's written some barbecue <laughs> stuff too, you might've read, um, really, really the, probably the tip of the spear when it came to uh, um, forming Food Waste Texas. Mm-hmm. Um, he wasn't the only person, but, but he was the guy that was pushing it. Um, and there, then, you know, when, we, when they actually formed it, there were about 50 or so folks that hammered out all the details, including Jeff Sable and Davey Griffin were there, um, and Ray Riley too. But I think that first barbecue summer camp, he and Jeff just had, I, I think Jeff and Jeff Sable and those guys were doing a barbecue class. It was like earliest days of the barbecue class that they do for undergrads. And he and Rob were just like, why don't we do this other thing, you know? And I think they had something similar that one of their professors had been doing, but it never really had been uh, popular. I think Rob said that they were, they were doing a barbecue camp, but serving ham sandwiches at lunch, <laughs> and uh, and so we took it over and did bar- we we planned for barbecue summer camp, which we thought was so clever, you know, 
And uh, it still uh, is in my head. Now we're now we're back in the side. Yeah, okay, maybe it wasn't so clever, but it, we it's it's catchy. It is. But we so they started doing that. They, the idea came in November, and we were like, let's get this out now so people can buy that as a Christmas present. So that started the whole six months in advance of ah, selling tickets. Ah, there you go. So we then, so then when Camp Brisket, when we decided to do that, we decided let's just do the same thing. It gives people time also to plan for it because it's a three days basically, yeah. and you got to get a hotel and it's it's College Station. It's not like you can fly into Austin and take a Uber to your hotel <laughs> and then walk to the conference, right? Yeah. It's you're, you're gonna fly into Austin or Houston and drive out there, and then you have to have a car, you know. So. So yeah, it's it gives people time to plan, and we started off selling tickets online. And the first time we did barbecue summer camp, we didn't even sell the amount of tickets we we had put as a goal. Oh. But we almost got there. It was probably like 30 people or something like oh. that, 35. And that quickly changed. Um, it started. I think it sold out the next year in about a week, and then it progressively went down. And then we added Camp Brisket in there, and that was that became even more popular. And I think the year before we decided to do the lottery, people logged on at 10 a.m. on whatever day it was, <laughs> and it was for Camp Brisket. And I usually would say, I'm the only, I was the only employee. I'm, now I'm the one of two employees of Food Waste Texas, but for nine years, it was just me. Mm -hmm. So I'd be in there that morning, and I would have the, the screen up on the computer, and I'd hit, hit you know, reset, and I could see each person as they were buying tickets. And I could also, we didn't have any sophisticated way of saying, because it was mostly, you know, you could buy them early if you were a member. And if we had some left, then non-members could try. Mm -hmm. And it was a higher price. Um, but it started selling out so quickly to members that then it was just like, what's the point? you got to be a member to go. Yeah. So I could pop on there and I could see. And I could check while it was happening, are you a member or not? You know. And then I'd go in and tell them, sorry, I'm going to cancel this out because you, you're not a member and it wouldn't be fair to our members. <laughs> and that day, I, hit, I got on there, I hit refresh w within about 10 seconds. It was... And it was sold out, and people were in the queue trying frantically oh. to get their information in. And there was like 60 people that had made it past the first level, and didn't fa get their information in quick enough before. So they got in saying they got a ticket, and when they tried to pay for it, it said it was sold oh. out. So oh, it was a disaster. I, I answered probably 400 emails and calls of people pissed off that I was there at 10, and I'm like, well, you know, it's it's not much we can do about it. It just it's super popular. It's like, it's like a concert ticket or something back in like the 90s. Yeah. And that, so that's what was happening. And, and what ended up, we also were realizing that we were getting some of the same people each year, too, that were able to get in and get a ticket somehow. And we weren't, you know, it was, they were just selling them online. So they were just there ready to go and had a system somehow of getting in and getting, getting it done. So we also wanted to make sure we were opening it up to a lot of people, you know, or not. So, this, so we put in some rules and we decided to make it a lottery. So everybody had the same chance the lottery right. is weighted on how many years you've been a member right right so that, that first year yeah well that's right so even the first year we weighted members who had been trying for a long time and hadn't gotten in um so yeah the longer you're a member and the weights have changed over time because we've gotten even more and more people interested yeah. so the, if you're a four-year member your weight is pretty high right so and, and even then it doesn't you don't always get drawn and it, it, it's frustrating for people i mean i'm constantly after the lotteries, uh, telling people, I, you know, thank you for hanging in there. You know, we, you will get in, I promise. This isn't going away. I'm in year two, and I highly doubt that. I think it's going to be a little while. Unless I can get it like a some kind of media pass, I'm not going to be well, going for all the time. Yeah, yeah, well, I'll be honest with you. I mean, we're. I'm considering doing some other things because it's gotten so popular that we had to finally implement a deadline, like a last time. If you were here for five years, you're just in. But now what's happening is, you know, there's so many of those yeah, guys too many, yeah. that we've had to expand the amount of people we take. So we still have lottery spots for other people yeah. because those 50 year guys have been trying forever. 50 year, I should say, not just guys, it's men and women. We're more women yeah. are coming now too. I mean, I think I had this past camp brisket 30 or so 50 year folks who just automatically got a spot. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, and then we ended up pushing it to 70. 75 or 80, I'd have to look, but pushing, and where in the past, we only wanted 50 people to come in because we wanted to make sure they had hands-on stuff. Yeah, Kim Brisket's a little bit easier because there's not, you know, we don't have 50 smokers for everybody to mess around with, you know, um, but but they still get to be right there firsthand and see all of it and, and feel everything and, 
Yeah. But, you know, it makes it harder the more you people you have. Right. Yeah, so definitely. So we'll have about at it, when we do Camp Brisket, there's going to be about 75 to 80 participants. And then, of course, then you have volunteers helping. There's a lot of students. So we end up oh, yeah, with about yeah. 100 people typically with all the people helping in the background. But yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, I've been talking to some folks who've been trying for a while and and realizing that, you know, there's going to be more and more people that get to that fifth year. So it, we're probably going to do something like, and it's going to, we're going to have to carefully do it. I'm not even sure how yet. Um, <laughs> so if anybody's out there has ideas, let me know. But probably something like where we go back to a non-member rate. And so, uh, this was modeled on um, the Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, hunting um, lottery they do every year, so okay. which I enter every year. So they on their properties they they try to keep healthy populations of white-tailed deer and also keep out uh, invasive species, exotic animals and stuff. So they will do a lottery every year for all of these properties around the state, and uh, you pay a fee up front, like three dollars to enter it, and then if you don't get drawn, you you you're weighted after that, just like uh, the barbecue camps. Um, so I, I, and I've been doing this for years and years and years. So I thought, why don't we do this for barbecue camp? So I called Texas Parks and Wildlife and they were like, well, we designed this ourselves. We hired a designer and they designed the whole system. And I was like, well, I can't do that. I don't have the money for that. So, <laughs> so we do an online, uh, random number generator. Mm -hmm. We have it set up to where it works and it works really well. Um, but they, the thing that we don't do is charge a fee up front for each lottery entry what you do is you pay for the membership membership right? yeah. the member. and the idea is that you know because of that membership you can do other things right and if you're in the state of texas that's the case if you're in oregon which we have a lot of <laughs> seattle and portland folks they're not going to come down for symposium very often you uh -huh. know and it's just not a whole lot that they they're going to be able to do so so what, we're, what i'm thinking about doing is switching it over to where non-members can pay a fee to enter the the lottery and then a, an increased fee for the ticket. Gotcha. Well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that way, members who have been around for a long time are still getting those benefits. And we can keep the lottery in place for those folks who've been around for four or five and then just sell these other tickets and set aside a bit to purchase on your own. And if you're a member, you can try still, yeah, too. Yeah. But I, I expect it's going to be one of those things where it, they're going to sell out in 10 seconds, just like. Yeah, yeah. It probably, so will. <laughs> it probably people will. People are going to be pissed off about it, but I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to put some disclaimers up and I don't know when that's going to happen yet. Well, especially with the way things are. Yeah. It's, it's, you've got some time to think about it and kind of. Yeah. It, mold well, and to be honest, that, that first year that we, we really decided to do it. Part of the reason that came about is because of all the complaints from that one time where people logged on at 10 and couldn't get it there. I mean, seriously, I'm, I'm not exaggerating 400 messages That's or calls. Lot. Yeah. And, and they were all mad since we instigated the, or in, implemented the uh, lottery. I maybe have five to 10 folks each time who were like, I can't believe that I didn't get drawn again. And, you know, but they're, they're, they're just frustrated. They know the rules. And yeah. I think that's the thing. The rules are set and people can see them and accept them. And when it's selling it straight online, there's really no, there's the rules of whatever your computer yeah, it's system. it's an open game, yeah. Do, so. And there's people that have like little programs, like there's a lot of like tricks and stuff these days, like for people who, that buy like, I don't buy shoes online, but I know kids that like buy like a an Air Jordan or something and they have like these little robot things that could like yeah. buy and it has a credit card already built in. So it just, it's, yeah. It's a, uh, yeah. I, and I know nothing about that stuff. So, so maybe I, that's I what's happening with some of those folks, but, but I, you know, I've had some, a couple of people tell, email me and say, this is a scam, Wow. <laughs> you know? I can't get, you know, I'm never going to get into this. And I'm like, well, it's, it's not a scam. It's, you know, we got lots of, lots of folks who've gone through the program and have, would come back in a heartbeat, you know? And well, there's, there's the red dirt barbecue festival that Chase Colson Colson puts on and it sells out within, I think 10 minutes or five minutes or three. Like it's something. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my whole take on, on doing this is the lottery, at least, evens the playing field. It's more fair, I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think it's a smart. So. And when I get my email or don't get, don't, I know that I'm not, it's just, it is, that's next year. I'll keep trying. You just keep trying. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a lot. I mean, if we, if we were doing, I mean, one thing about the Texas Parks and Wildlife thing is there's so many different places you can end up. You see the drawing, they draw for each hunt and there's a bunch of them. For Camp Brisket, there's one every year. I mean, if we, if we had the ability to do two or three, it might alleviate some of that. But I, I would do it, but it's just really hard for the guys at Texas A&M because they're, 
you know, this is this they're basically donating their time to us, um, and That's true. they're doing all these other things. You know, they do beef 101 and pork 101. There are similar events. Um, and it's just for them. And that's, that's where they make their, you know, they make a lot of money off the, well, they don't make a lot, but that's, that's a fundraiser for that program. Right. And, and it's educational and that, that's what this is as well, but they've been kind enough to bring us on board with this stuff. I mean, we, we, we created together, but they didn't have to, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, they're interested in barbecue and they, they, they like what we're doing. And, uh, it's been a really great partnership going, you know, well, they so can't far. Handle, they can't handle 200, 300 people. Right. There, well, so. and they, yeah, first off, we can't fit more than we already have now. I mean, I probably maxed it out at this point, yeah. but the time it involved in doing them, it's just, we did, I think one year we did two barbecue summer camps in the summer and it nearly killed those guys. I mean, they were working their butts off and I, you know, I, I work behind the scenes getting all this set up, but you know, the day of the event, I'm mostly walking around talking to people because they've got it all set up, you know, they're done and they've got it running and, and this, but they've, so they've been working for two, three weeks getting ready and they, they, the, you know, they get out of Camp Brisket and then Tuesday they have Beef 101 or something, yeah. you know, so it's really, really difficult to schedule extra ones on their end. Um, and, and I just, I've asked in the past and, and they've explained it and I just, you got to, it's, you have to respect it. And yeah. maybe someday they'll be like, yeah, let's do another one. And then we'll jump on, on that. But at the moment, they're just too busy. They yeah. can't do more. Yeah, so I, I don't remember where we left off, but I think, was it in September that we were talking? I think it was think probably so, yeah. in September. So we'd already done the Camp Brisket drawing um, in yes. August. We, we had planned to see what would happen. Of course, you know, that was... We weren't too uh, optimistic, and we ended up having to, to move it. So currently, last year's barbecue summer camp and this coming January's Camp Brisket will both be happening in summer 2021. No date yet, just summer 2021. Right? Well, the, 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 I can't remember the, the barbecue summer camp from last year. I mean, there's no there's no tickets available to either. So yeah, yeah. it's I think the June 4th through the 6th or something is barbecue summer camp. So the 2020 version of Barbecue Summer Camp is June 4th through the 6th, 2021. Gotcha. Okay. And then there's no date for Camp Brisket yet. I need it. They probably know. They just haven't told me yet because I, we haven't talked in, a, mm-hmm. in a, about a month. But it's going to be in July. And then we just did the drawing for 2021 Barbecue Summer Camp. Yeah, I tried. And I had caveats <laughs> in that one. You know, this is not happening until you know next the summer after next probably. If you were lucky enough to get a slot for 2021, it's for 2022. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll do two of them next summer too. Okay. So we, we're going to be catching up. We're going to do all the camps that we have uh, just to keep going because we have too many people trying to get in. Okay. So it's going to be two camps in a row, uh, two summers in a row. And then. Oh, I see. And, yeah. And yeah, so 2022 will be January Camp Brisket. On time, regular camp brisket. June will be 2021 barbecue summer camp. Sometime probably July will be 2022 barbecue summer camp. And then you'll so, be caught up, right? And then you'll be then back. we'll be caught up, yeah. With the yeah. with the barbecue portion portion of wow. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know we're we've been floating around for a little while. We don't have dates yet for all of it. So you know what we've been telling people that got drawn is, you know, first you know if you can't make it when the dates are announced, we will you know, refund you if you want, and you will go back to as if you didn't win, and you'll have a clean slate, not a clean slate. If you had, you know, you'll be been where trying you're... for four years, that would still count for you, you know, yeah. later. Or we'll just move those folks to an, uh, a later camp if they want. It just means down the road, but it could still be, we want to honor the those spots. If they got them, they can hang on to them as long as they need to. If someone can't make it, then does that open a spot for somebody else mm-hmm. that's next next down the rung? Okay. Yeah, so what, and we've always done that. So if, uh, yeah, it makes sense. Within reason, if somebody, you, we'll, we'll do this up till the last week probably. So if somebody called me in at the end of May this, this year and said, I can't make it next week, we would honor, we would just move them to the next year. Okay. Since they already, you know, I'd hate to, I'd hate to, you know, mess some, mess up something like that for somebody who's been waiting and waiting. Yeah, waiting this And year, if yeah. we can get somebody to come within a week, We'll go down that list of, of wait list, but yeah. So as soon as spots open up, we're we're going down the wait list. And I see. Used to be we drew the wait list too, but now it's just 
whoever entered the drawing and didn't get drawn, it's by seniority, how long they've been trying. Yeah, so this, so I noticed when I was reading the, the fine print this last time, it's really more seniority. It's not... It's not a randomness with a with a certain percentage and all that jazz. It's more. Well, we we were forced to, to not forced. I mean, we want people to get through as as much as possible. We we it got a little bit uh, ridiculous though because we'd have we had the folks that were in their fifth year trying to get in, and you know they have a much better chance to get in, but it's still just a chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, you know, it, so what we did is we implemented a. If you're to the fifth year trying to get in, you're just automatically in. Gotcha. So what's happening is that takes up, you know, those fifth year guys and and gals are taking up, you know, that one probably about one half of the spots immediately. That's just how many people we've been, ha- you know, have trying for the so long, and then then we we do the do the lottery for the remaining spots, and we mostly get people that have been trying for four and three years in those. But you you know, every once in a while somebody gets the golden ticket. <laughs> and gets in their first, you know, year. Uh, you know, we always have a couple of those, but not many, not many anymore. So has the response been pretty? Are people pretty excited that they have a chance this this will this go ahead this 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 next year? But are they pretty excited? Yeah, I, I think people are pretty. Most of the, most people are pretty. Uh, op, I guess has been a positive response for that new rule about the fifth year thing. I've talked to some other folks and. He's, he may, I the guy I'm thinking of might even watch your show. I don't know, but, uh, so he'll probably know that, that I talked to him, but, um, you know, we, we have so many folks from out of town or out of the state and we'll get into this a little bit with food when we talk about food waste, Texas, but the people out of state, so much of our, our, uh, the benefits of being a member of food waste, Texas are being able to go to the events in state. Yeah. And do. So people out of state aren't getting that benefit. For the most part, we've had people come in, you know, they've been waiting for years and years to get in Camp Brisket and they see that we're doing a symposium on something they might be interested in. So they'll come in for that anyway. You know, I've had people from come from all over the country in that, but not not as much. You know, there's not as much interest in coming to a symposium where you're listening to talks and uh, then eating, although it is a heck of a lot of fun, as there is people are just interested in barbecue right now and have been for a decade now and more so than they've had in the past. Yeah, so I've talked to, the, to some folks about maybe implementing a per a fee per uh, like it, you don't have to be a member, you just pay a fee to enter the drawing. Because um, um, right now you you buy a year membership and you can enter as many drawings as we do during that year. Um, this would be more like a fifteen. Oh, and above and beyond. So. Okay, I, I see that. Yeah, so that would help people who are don't need you know the membership doesn't benefit them anymore i think we'd still have to figure out something to benefit the members who are paying more Mm -hmm. to do the same thing basically they just get those other benefits so i don't know well i'm still i'm gonna have to talk to the board about that and figure out how we do it i want it to work but also too for someone like me who i'm in california i i would love to go to the symposiums and the different the wine of it i'd love to go to them but even if i can't i i'm happy that i'm supporting and I would hope that right. other people are, you know, you're supporting something that you love and a sort an organization that you they care about. So you would hope that that exists. Well, and I think that that that's really important. And it's, you know, if I'm going to be critical of myself in, in a leadership position, especially over the last three or four years, and especially with COVID hitting, is making that argument and getting it out there. And we, you know, we usually do a, a newsletter, and we haven't been able to do that lately. Um, that's actually something we're going to put out in January just to get started with that again. But That'd letting people know this is what we do and this is what you're supporting, right? Um, even then, though, you know, somebody who just is interested in barbecue who lives in you know North Dakota or something, they they're not going to necessarily care that we are interviewing folks that make you know tamales. You yeah. know, so you, you know but what I mean? They might. They might. They might. And, and but it doesn't hurt to you know, open their eyes and to mm. expand their horizons, which of course, that's, of course, that's, that's your mindset too. And I think too, I that it, that is something that's another reason why I want to do this because as much as I know about food ways, there's a lot that I don't understand and don't get. And that will be good in January when you have the newsletter and have the, the interaction, right. with the people, even though it's one sided, it's still interaction with people. I mean, that, that's a great point. I, and honestly, these are I, this idea that I've had this discussion with this one guy about is just something I've thought about in my own on my own and haven't really, you know, discussed it with our board, or, you know, our advisory board. And I, you know, I take their their input pretty, 
seriously. So it's possible we won't do a thing and we'll just try to do a better job of letting people know this is what we're doing, this is what you're supporting. Because what they're supporting is collecting food history for mm -hmm. the most part. We're, you know, collecting, so we're doing what you do, where you're doing these sort of interviews, right? Uh, we're, we're just doing audio, right? And uh, those those stories get archived on our website and at UT Austin and they'll be there forever. So we've, we've sort of, we're, we're in a lull because UT won't let me travel. Well, they, 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 I could travel as much as I want. I just can't get reimbursed for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so part uh, of this is yes, no, I, and and that'll and that'll change hopefully as things start to build momentum in 2021. I would hope so. Yeah, I think what we're going to do is plan plan out a, several uh, different projects for oral histories, oral history interviews, and I'll do some, and we'll probably hire somebody. We we won a grant a few years, well, a couple years ago now that. We still have a, a lot of money for for uh, Texas wine industry, so I might hire somebody to do on a contract basis those and and fill out that do you know use that money for that the would be great that things. would be really interesting I, I've I've yeah. seen it grow from afar and I've interviewed some people that are involved with the wine industry and it's it's expanding exponentially it seems it's crazy I, I think the last number I'd heard there was there was something like five hundred or to six hundred wineries or vineyards in the state amazing that's uh -huh. an amazing number. And then, you know, the biggest problem is there's not enough people growing wine, growing grapes in Texas. There's plenty of plenty of places you could do it. There's just not enough people doing it yet. So people, wineries are still having to get grapes from outside the state. Um, although there, there are a few that and most of them use some Texas grapes. But there and there are a couple, well, maybe more than a couple wineries that only use Texas grapes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's interesting. It's fun. That's one of the reasons we do that Camp Vino, which we did cancel that this year. Yeah, when what, uh, when is that, that? I was looking online. I was trying to find what what roughly what date is that around? It's in the fall, I and mean, I just I just opened it up and put it back online. So it'll be I think the second week of November. Okay. Um, and I think by then we should be all in good shape. Huh, you know, it seems yeah. like people are getting getting the vaccine now, mm -hmm. and you know we should be in good shape to do it. So I'm I'm expecting we went in and set dates for that one. I can't remember the exact date, but it's. It's the second weekend of November, and we go out to Fredericksburg in the Hill Country, and there's a there's a place there called the Pioneer Museum where they brought all these old homes from around oh. you know, out out on properties, and and they've collected them there, and then there's an old church, so we we hold sort of a it's sort of a mixture of our symposium and barbecue oh. summer camp or camp brisket either of them because we we use the horticulture department at U at uh, Texas A&M. Yeah. And those guys come over, they have a whole viticulture section, and those guys come over and talk about grapes, wine history, oh, that's so several different several different things. They even talk about like what you what you see when you what you're reading when you read the labels, you know, what what you should know. And then we drink a, a heck of a lot of wine and eat a lot of great food. So that's what the symposium crossover is. And so that'll be November of next year. Do you is that is that something that sells out or is that something that most people can get well, to? We've only done it twice, and okay. it's gotten you know first year I think you know, we and again it's small we we keep them small just like the camps. Um, the first year I think we sold half of what we expected we could sell, and and then it got a little bit more the second year, and then of course we didn't do it. So I think the other thing I like to do, which we did with barbecue summer camp when we first started, is to slowly figure out how this works before we really push it. Yeah, um, that's smart. And I feel like we have. Uh, for Camp Vino, I think we got it to where we can pop this out pretty easily. And part of the reason is because we've been doing camp, barbecue summer camp, camp brisket for so long. Uh, I was able to handle it almost all, all on my own, um, except for not not on my own, just the, the logistics. Yeah. And then have all the 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 to coordinate uh, bar, properly. The horticulture guys there as well talking, and the and of course you can't do anything like that without owners of the vineyards and yeah. wineries helping out. So, so but. Uh, the, the logistics part of it, which is what we, the symposium is a bear because of that, that always scares me. So we always try to do it slow um, because I'll have some volunteers and I have one employee and, and you know, most people are, are there to help, but they, you know, they're, they're volunteers. So, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to get all, all of you can out of it. So mm -hmm. I, I've had some really late nights sometimes. So I, I try to slow go slow into mm -hmm. it and i feel like we're we're there so we'll probably go full bore and try to really uh, advertise for it and get as many people there as we as we can to fill it up so well definitely help spread the word but i was also thinking too a lot of these things will people will be so excited to get together 
in groups of people. Yeah. And it, it hope, like, I, like I'm hopeful that that's what, and, and it feels like it'll probably be the summer when people really can. So I think that I think that'll help any kind of event that you have. Our first real event will be our first in-person event will probably be barbecue summer camp. Yeah. And, and I know those, the, all the, we, we didn't have it. I think we may have had one refund request. You know, once they get those tickets, they hang on to them. Mm-hmm. You know, so whether it'll be fun to get, they'll they'll be ready to go by the time that comes around, and so will we. It'll be June. It'll be people will be just clamoring to do it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we and we didn't. You know, the first thing we postponed in this year, this past year, was the symposium, mm-hmm. which was planned for San Antonio, and we thought at the time, well, maybe we can do it in the fall, and of course, you know that kept getting pushed and pushed, and what we're in that what we're going to end up doing with that one. Yeah, I was going to ask about that one because I was curious about that one too. Well, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to try to do, we're in fact working on that right now, putting together something uh, virtually for the, for the spring. Okay. Not a, not, that is not at all like the symposium was going to be in San Antonio. It'll probably be geared a little bit more to uh, the restaurant industry and, and you know, some of the effects of the pandemic on, on yeah. that and how that's going. Um, and recovery, hopefully by, by March, we'll be able to talk about some recovery as well. And then we're going to, in the fall, plan for in the fall to co- go to San Antonio and do the symposium we plan to do oh, in March. I see. Okay. And then, and then we'll, we'll then turn around and probably eight months later, early, early summer, late spring, probably right before barbecue summer camp, do a do 2021 symposium, a 2022 symposium. So we won't have missed <laughs> anything. We're, we're basically just doubling up. You'll be having a, the virtual one. We'll take the place of the one, yeah, that, the was this year, one that was this year. Right. I guess we're, we're missing that. Basically what we're going to end up, end up doing is missing this year's um, because all the people that bought tickets for March are just going to, those, unless they want to refund, they'll be transferred over to the fall symposium where we actually do food. And, you know, just a reminder of the symposium is, is we pick a, a theme and last year it was supposed to be our 10 year anniversary. And we were talking about San Antonio and that Texas in general is sort of this crossroads of, of food and culture and not not just now but from the very beginning uh, of this before Europeans were even here we were going to do all of that you know wow what we do then is we have scholars we have food writers we have chefs we have uh, historians come in uh, that focus on food and talk about that theme in some way so we hit it from a bunch of different ways but then we also serve seven meals and they're chef chef uh, cooked meals and they're all driven by what we've talked about. So usually we're talking ah, about something like tangible and then we're eating it right after that, you know, so very much like this, the Southern Foodways Alliance does. Uh, but there's some, in fact, we modeled it after them. You know, we can't in we general. Can't, yeah. The whole thing. It. Well, not the whole, but it's, it's the concept was, was pulled from totally there. the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that what they do is, is pretty amazing stuff. And ours is on a much smaller scale and, and we, we probably don't do they, they they have so many things going on at that symposium. Ours is much much more streamlined and uh, not streamlined, but just kind of pared down. Where we're, it's mostly what we're doing is the talks. We might have some music that fits the the theme, you know, in the evenings at at, at the meals. But but you know those meals are connected with their the meals are all all usually Texas producers have have donated or you know we've gone to find what we need it's texas chef the drinks are all from companies that make drinks in texas so it's it's a fun time you know we're really we're really celebrating all the stuff that's going on or right now when we're eating but also in the state but also kind of looking back to not necessarily happy times in some cases we may be looking back at, at some issues that that uh, were happening in the 19th century or something yeah like things that. that are ugly and things that but they're all yeah. part of the history yeah you got to be careful with the word celebrate right when you go back you don't you you want to you want to acknowledge a lot of those things that have happened mm-hmm. and 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 also give credit where credit's due For in sure. a lot of cases because some of that history has been erased um, because of systems that we have which is fascinating um, not all and of it. Ter- terrible and fascinating all wrapped yeah. in one yeah. Well, well, now with are they three day events or is it a two day event? Yeah, it's it's two and a half typically. Okay. So we usually gather on a Thursday night and uh, have have a meal and maybe a, a keynote speaker, and then all day Friday and all day Saturday and Saturday night being kind of the closing big dinner, 
um, typically. And Sunday's a travel day for people to get back to where they are to. Yeah, we, we used to do like a Sunday breakfast, but it was sparsely attended for the most part because people were trying to get home and mm-hmm. everybody was tired by then. It's a so. long time, but like any, if you do anything for two or three, a festival, a yeah. music festival that you'd love for three days, eventually you're like, I got to get home. <laughs> this is so... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a little bit lower key than that, but uh, it's <laughs> no, still No, of course, I'm, just, I'm trying to equate. <laughs> Will it be the same price roughly? So what we do at the symposium, so barbecue summer camps, we consider those fundraisers as well. So, yeah. I mean, we, we certainly have a... a pretty hefty expense and we split everything with Texas A&M meat science. Um, but we do make some money off those. Yeah. The symposium, we do, we make $0. Oh, we okay. usually have set it up to where we bring in just enough to pay for everything we need to do. Sometimes we'll make a little bit, sometimes we'll lose yeah. money, you know, it just depends. But the, the virtual one will not be the, we'll have a price set on that, but it'll be minuscule compared to what the symposium, the symposium usually falls around $300 a ticket. Okay. Like I, was, I was trying to think of, and then yeah. does, and then you also help people with lodging. If there's you, you explain where, like where do they get lodging close? Oh, to that money. Yeah. The bulk of that money goes to speakers, uh, hotel rooms, honestly. Yeah. I mean, probably half of it goes to that. Yeah. But for me, if I was coming to San Antonio on your package, it would also say you should stay at this hotel or there's five hotels that are close by or, or... yeah, yeah. You will usually get a, a hotel room block somewhere. And then yeah, the thing about it is we, we, when we first started this Airbnb wasn't a thing now, you know, we can set up a room block and it'll barely get filled because people have so many other options now. So that is, so true. we stopped, we stopped doing any kind of like uh, contract based uh, room block because it was too dangerous for us. We don't have enough money to cover a bunch of rooms that didn't get used. Well, that's true. Like even people coming out for Texas Monthly, I think they all do Airbnb places. And... Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty pretty nice to be able to do that, but uh, it you know it's hard to plan mm-hmm. <laughs> some sometimes. So, which is one of the reasons we started doing. You know, we're going to be in San Antonio, but we started doing more rural areas with a, a, an event we did in Brenham. The symposium, the last symposium we did was in Brenham, and it was great. We were the biggest thing in town that week that weekend. You know, we're usually not even close to that, and we had no problem filling up that hotel because there's just not as many options. And that's a great thing too to highlight small Texas towns because, especially too from afar, as I'm learning and I'm working on a big project for Texas that's barbecue related, and I see all these small towns and I keep thinking what it was like when I lived in Taylor and drove to Austin, driving through these small small towns. And yeah. you don't get in California. It seems like everything is just. A large town. Just... <laughs> there is a part of California where that exists. That, it's more, yeah. LA. It's on the outskirts. It's not, <laughs> you have to drive pretty far to that. Even even if yeah. I like going out to like Victorville and all that out there, yeah. it used to be small. Now it's all connected. It's right, urban right. sprawl, I guess. Well, and you know, that's sort of the, what like I-35 is between Austin and San Antonio now. But yeah, we went to Brenham and, you know, some other places we have on our radar would be like Victoria um, El Paso is not really a small town, but it's it's not it's a place we want to go. And, and, you know, it's sort of a different you can pretty if you live in Texas, you can pretty much drive anywhere central mm-hmm. if, unless you're living way out west. But if you want to get to El Paso, you're pretty much flying out there or driving eight hours. Yeah, it's a, I, I've, I've looked at it on a map to get from Arizona. You're like, wow, that's that's a drive. So I lived at, lived around San Antonio most of my life. And when I graduated high school, I started traveling more and. I realized that El Paso is halfway to Los Angeles from San Antonio. So Oh wow, that is true. It's it's pretty it's pretty ridiculous. Yeah, so Victoria is one. We're we're talking about El Paso and then we're gonna do something in the one of the sim then so these are probably the next three symposia. Mm-hmm. Um uh, definitely El Paso and then definitely somewhere in the valley. So I don't know if that'll be McAllen or somewhere around Brownsville, but those are those are where we're looking, and we got to get up in the panhandle at some point, you know. Wow, that's that's so, and it's it's optimistic and nice, and that's another reason why I wanted to talk to you again to f- to finish this up because I think that it's nice to know that there are things coming up in the future because it's it's been such a bleak, strange, odd year that to know yeah. that there is like there's good stuff coming up and that that people are still planning on doing things is. I've even, there's some concerts that I had tickets for and my friend wrote me and said, do you want to, should we get a refund? I said, no, let's just, you know, let's hope that the, <laughs> yeah. if you get good of the, hang, yeah. Just hang on. Yeah. Let's see if you can hold out. Karma, well, karmically, it's important. What, the barbecue camps have saved us, honestly. I mean, we have, we have very few, uh, you know, as long as we're not doing anything, our expenses are pretty low. It's basically my salary and, and my assistant's salary. So we can usually manage that with memberships. 
and the events, the barbecue camps. And we've been able to do that. It's st we're still going to be close. We might be in the hole and in, in when UT takes, uh, they, they, they encumber the salaries for the year and then dole them out. So usually the fall, especially next fall, we will, we'll probably be in the hole for a few weeks until we've made that back up because we raise all of our money outside the university. They give us nothing. They give us a, a an office okay. and I'm, I don't, I'm not being ungrateful. I love UT is amazing. And, and, uh, but, but we do raise all of our money outside and that's memberships. That's the events. That's some, sometimes we, we target and get, uh, uh, donations from companies like HEB places like that. Also too, is there any type of, or is that coming up? I, I, I kind of noticed when I was doing some Google searches like last week, or the week before, is there any merchandise that's available or is there, yeah. is that, so is that a revenue stream too for you guys? It's a small one. I mean, we we don't we don't look to make too much on that stuff. We we view it as as uh, more just getting the word out. So um, you can on our website there is a there is a merchandise link, and it takes you to the membership uh, space that mm -hmm. we have through Wild Ap Apricot, which is where That's most what everybody's Wild Apricot, yeah. yeah, all the members have gotten used to that now by by now. So that it, it's there too. So you can buy T-shirts and hats and and some koozies and things like that. But we sell most of that at the events, mm -hmm. but you could do it online. You can order it online. It just costs a little bit more because you're paying for shipping. For so, sure. So if, yeah. so if I'm a member and I live in Texas, what, what else can I get out of this? Am I getting, there's a symposiums, there's, is the, the wine one, is that considered a symposium as well? Or is it an event? Well, we call it, we call it Cambino. That would actually, that's actually more that we do make some money off that one, or we, we plan to eventually, mm -hmm. we haven't yet. We've bro broken even most of it, mostly. The Camp Vino, the two barbecue camps, and the two barbecue camps are different because they're harder to get into. We do the lotteries. Camp Vino, you can pretty much just buy a ticket at the moment. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it'll get popular enough where you have to do a lottery of some sort or wait in line. The symposium, we can take many more tickets to that because it's usually a larger venue. And we have only sold, I don't think we've ever really sold that out. We can, we've sold a lot on occasion, uh, but those, those events are really a lot of fun and we're trying to keep those as low as possible and then we also do we have one series that, that we've been doing called um, breaking bread where we go to various uh, places like we, we've done it in Houston Dallas we were planning one in San Antonio before this happened we've done one in Austin but it's basically finding we started off thinking about it finding a bakery a, a local bakery of some sort and and putting together some small uh, meal with drinks included and then having a, a speaker. That's all it really was. So it's an evening and it's free to members. So those are- That we, would we be great. I think that would be important yeah. for people. Yeah, so we're, we're doing, a, and again, those are only in Texas. So the people that are way out, you know, it's hard to, let's, they're not gonna fly down for an evening, no. you know, like that. But but it is a free event for, for members. So it's one benefit, you know, there. We, we wanna plan more of those. And one thing that's happened, one benefit, I think, from there's not many, if, if any, besides this one from the pandemic is that we've realized that you can do pretty cool virtual events. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't done it yet, but we, you know, we have friends that have been doing a great job with that, like Jose Rolat, the, the guy that's the Texas Monthly uh, Taco Editor. He's an amazing guy, and he's done a great job with virtual talks and, and setting stuff up like that. So we talked to him about that. He's going to be heavily involved in the symposium virtual event that we do. That's smart. But we've realized that we can do other smaller things like this too. And you know, that might be a way for people outside the state to get involved too. I, I think that would be um, really neat. I would love to spread the word or even assist you in any way to do that, because I think that would be a nice thing. And I think that the world is evolving towards having more of those things and technology is getting better these yeah. Skype and Zoom is, you know, it's pretty good. There's, there's still issues, but it's, sure. and, yeah, if you watch CNN or whatever channel you're watching, <laughs> you'll see that there's a lot, they have lots of problems with communication, even the big boys. But I, yeah. I think that this is, it's a nice touch and you could also get people to places, even they, within Texas that you can't travel or they, that they're not able because of work or life or whatever. That would be great. I yeah. think that'd be smart. And you can well, get lots of people involved. Yeah. And well, the, and the other thing we want to do is, and we've been talking about it and, trying to figure out how to do it and trying to raise money for it, which would be a podcast that would be at least monthly, you know, or, or several seasons. And 
it's just it's been a bear to put together, and and uh, I just haven't been able to get yeah, that done myself. Yeah, well, I, I can tell you this: it's not easy all the time. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, with you, life in the way. You no, know, you know. <laughs> Many uh, times at two or three in the morning of editing things because I don't have time. Because yeah, it's it's a challenge, and and also to maybe set yourself up for not as not weekly or not yeah not like every month or every other month because then because then you know you're not you don't feel that pressure, but you also can provide good content. Yeah, for for us it would be something like six to eight episodes would be a season. Yeah. And we'll come back when we get the next one done, you know, whenever that is. And so there won't be a whole lot of pressure. The problem is just getting started in the first place because I don't have time to do it myself. I don't really want to be a podcast host. <laughs> uh, I could, but it really would take. You know, I also teach occasionally, yeah. and 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 uh, I just I don't know that that I, I don't know that uh, my voice is one that people want to hear on that anyway. So <laughs> well, look at uh, my we'll voice. see how that goes. <laughs> you think people want to hear? My... <laughs> Surprisingly, they, they want it. They must. <laughs> they get all the emails from me and listen to me at events. Maybe they want to break somebody else. <laughs> but uh, the problem there is, you know, I don't want to just have somebody, you know, volunteer to do that. I want to be able to pay them. Yeah, yeah. You know, or pay for the stories really pretty well. And and that's one thing we prided ourselves on, uh, especially with some of the events, is being able to compensate the chefs in some way by the by the ingredients for the most part unless it was donated you know sometimes like i say we'll get heb to donate stuff and they'll donate what we you know what we want because <laughs> yeah. it's usually, they usually got texas ingredients in there as well so we try to whatever little thing we can do um, because so many of these different festivals and things like that it's the responsibility mm-hmm. of the restaurant or the chef to bring what they get and it's it's a of course, it's a good advertising moment for them, but um, you know, they're for us in symposium, they're in front of maybe a hundred people, so we want to be able to compensate them at, yeah. at least somewhat. I just talked to Sam Jones again, and we were talking about how 150 days a year he would be off on di- different festivals, and it's great and all, but also too, it is his time, his time away from family, his time away from from a lot of different things, and you want, yeah, you definitely, it feels good if you're compensated in some way. It feels like you're appreciated. Yeah. Usually, usually it's out of pocket, you know, so yeah. um, we at least try to buy the ingredients in most cases or, or let them sell whatever the heck they want to sell. Anyway, so that's that, that's another reason the symposium we have to keep it a little bit higher. Yeah. We're, try, we're trying to do that some. What about uh, with the oral histories? Is that something that anyone can listen to or is that something that you have to be a member to? No, no you, they're on our website. So that those things are open to the public as long as the, the person we interviewed is okay with it. Mm-hmm. So the way those work is, you know, you're going to set it up with a, a theme. Uh, well, the theme is usually their life. It's their life. It's not yeah. with the theme. I'm thinking <laughs> of the symposium. But yeah, you're going out to interview them and, and you just want to, you know, it's food based. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm the interviewer, I'll try to steer it back to that. Like the last one I did, it was it was a wine interview, basically. So yeah, we're talking about their life and, and how they started their winery and, and things like that. So they're usually an hour long, but those things, we consider that an academic venture mm-hmm. that, and, and we go in with specific a specific set of questions that we may stay there or not, but the, the idea is to do kind of like what you're doing, you know, let, let that person tell their story, you know, and, and, and we try to get at their history and then connect that back to their history and food, whatever that might be. Because sometimes it's restaurant owners, sometimes it's somebody in the grocery industry, sometimes it's just a person. You know, they eat. Everybody eats. So we, we focus on. Sometimes when we do that, we'll, we have a, a theme like uh, rural, you know, rural farming or something like that. So we'll talk to people and, and focus around that. But it's still what you're doing is you're getting people talking about their lives in their words, and that's just not something as a historian you see. When I'm trying to write something, or do I mean when I was working on my dissertation or mm-hmm. whatever, I'm especially the like 19th century, with that which is my typical. That's where I'm focused most of the time in my work. I don't get, I don't get everyday people. It's no. people who made the paper, you know, famous folks, something that shows up in you know official documents where you might get a marriage record or something like that. But you don't get their words, how they felt about whatever moment you might be exploring. And that's what's intriguing. So intriguing. And it's yeah. so valuable too, because that's, that's, that's real life. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think, you know, one thing you could say about them is, you know, it's just their opinion. Well, yeah, it's their opinion on their lives. I mean, they're, they're, you, they may have, everybody has plenty of opinions, but this is the way they feel about their life. The, tw- the stories they're telling, you know, they're having to remember them. Mm-hmm. So memory is fallible, obviously, but <laughs> yeah, in, you know, I'm, I could interview a person one day and then several years later, and they might have a slightly different version of their story. 
So I always think of it as a snapshot of, of their life sure. at that moment. But in 50 years or longer, historians or whoever will have this kind of store of oral history, listening to their, not only the reading their, hearing their stories, but hearing their voice, you know, actual, their voices, um, which I think is really important. That means a um, lot. Yeah. It, it adds so much texture, yeah. Yeah. Well, when you go on our website, you can hear the the full audio. You can read it if you don't feel like listening to it. You, you There's also almost always a transcript. We If there's not one, we're working on it. That's smart. I should um, do that too. Yeah. Yeah. There's usually photos. Just to get people to start you know, understanding more about what food weighs and about the oral histories. And- well, I'd love for you to, to get a wide range of those, but the, we do have a pretty good amount of barbecue ones for, for your audience that they might want to listen to. That's sort of my niche. But yeah, but I also do, like, I love food. I love people. But it's, I think that would be sort of, well, I could start there and then move forward. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have, uh, so this, going back to how we got started with this, I mean, I, I know you you know about Republic of Barbecue, right? The book. Yeah. And that set of grad students, which I was one at the time that did these interviews. I mean, we interviewed Bobby Miller, you know, which is amazing. Yeah. And, and, and several other folks, I mean, the, uh, Rick Schmidt from Kreitz, uh, all, there's a bunch of people in that book and those interviews are available still because we were able the, that was actually done for the Southern Foodways Alliance, but we're, we're trading barbecue interviews since we got those, they, they let me have them when we started in 2010. And they have them as well, but and, and I'm trading them 25 interviews. So so I we've done Aaron Franklin and um, the folks up at Pecan Lodge. We've done a bunch of them in Texas since then, and, and it, SFA also has those as well um, Gosh, as part I, of that. I project. feel so naive. I need to go. I need to go back and look at those because I guess I'm inundated with so much information. I forgot that that exists. Or yeah. Not. Well, and the great thing about barbecue in Texas is we're not the only ones doing it. Like. Uh, I think I've mentioned this before to you, but uh, Daniel Vaughn's interviews are pretty great. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I I don't mind pumping those things up because oh, I yeah. would I would I would archive those in a heartbeat for the most part. They're they're really well done. They're pretty thorough. Uh, you know, there's there's some there are some little details that we do as, as a as a just for documentation purposes as an oral history. He's not far off of just what we would consider oral history. He does a really good job of it. So and he's got tons. So haven't you seen too from the early days because I've I've been friends with him since like the early when he was first uh, blogging he's yeah. become such a great writer not that he wasn't good before but you could just tell he's honed his craft and honed his craft he's totally yeah he's really yeah he, yeah I, I agree but I, I I've talked to him before I told him you know whenever y'all want to archive those interviews you know where to do it we got we got a, we got an archive ready to go i don't know if texas monthly will be amenable to that but uh, we're happy to take them whenever they're ready that's the rub but it's still it's, yeah. still, it's still really interesting and and it's and I, I think yeah you're doing kind of what i'm doing i like to not just talk to people that everyone knows i like to kind of i want to get the whole picture as much as i can right now while it's you know while i still have a chance yeah in the me yeah i mean you're doing that's that's the other thing so there's daniel vaughn there's stuff you're doing, which includes video as well. You know, there's what we're doing. And then there are, you know, numerous food writers who are doing really great stories. Barbecue is since about 2005 or so has been really well documented, um, uh, you know, over, over these last 15, 20 years, much more than it had been. JC Reed's doing. Uh, yeah. Such Talk about a great job. writer. He oh. does a really good job too. Yeah. So. And he makes you feel it's a, it's very comforting. And then I, I, Robert Moss over at, uh, at Southern Living, he's just yeah, he, like there's a lot of people. Once they get passion, they get the bug. And I think even like Jim Shah- Shaheen is as Jim Shaheen. Yeah, he used to be yeah. I think at Texas Monthly. Now he's I don't think he's writing much up, and he's in New York or New Jersey or something. Yeah, we can't forget, and you, 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 we also can't start talking about all those people without mentioning Rob Walsh Rob, as well. He's one of kind of the Rob pioneers Walsh. of. Of barbecue writing back, or at least a modern version of it, you know. So. Yeah, Rob, I was just bugging him like a couple weeks ago. I'm like, come on, please come on my show. There's, I'll just talk oysters. I just, I'll talk anything with you. Just because <laughs> he. Has I mean, you can smoke. Life. You can smoke oysters too. So. <laughs> <laughs> and he likes barbecue. He likes everything. But it's yeah, he's yeah, he's a pioneer. And then I, I'm just actually starting to publicize a lot of my old interviews that two or three years ago people didn't know about. And I had a great one, Pat Sharp, and that was really yeah interesting because she has such a history. That that people there was before Daniel Vaughn, there was Pat Sharp. You know, one of the things about Pat Sharp is she's she's a food critic, right? So most of the time she's doing review-based um, stories, but she wrote 
a story recently about the loss of that, you mm -hmm. know, the loss of being able to sit around with, not sit around, but I mean like mm -hmm. go to these places with people you love and sit around the table with, you know, meal you're, you may be critiquing it, you may not be, um, that I thought was pretty beautiful. That was in um, the, the, ho the taco edition. I, I think it was like the one with the Jose's taco. Oh. I think it yeah. was, it was a recent one. Yeah. Yeah. That was a great, yeah. and that, and that's where she truly shines. Like she's great as a critic, but she's amazing. God, she's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's what a great world. So I want to, before I wrap this up, all the different ways that people can get a hold of you guys and to be a member. I know we talked a little bit of it before, so if it's redundant, sure. we apologize. But I mean, the, the best, the, the best place to start is foodwaystexas.org. Mm -hmm. So it's foodways, Texas, all all together, no spaces. You don't have to capitalize it. dot org, and from there you can usually figure out everything. But uh, if you need to get in touch with us, um, Marvin at foodwaystexas. dot org is the best spot. Okay. Or info at foodwaystexas. dot org. To sign up for a membership, is it you could sign up year round? There's not a certain no. Cutoff and right in there. fact, we track when you sign up, so we can tell. Like we can give you that that credit from you know whatever whatever month it is so you you don't have to renew in january right away you renew whenever you bought it in the first place because i know that a lot of people that are, wa are watching this or listening are probably like how do i sign up for these camps so so if you say if you sign up in june once you've lapped june then you're a one year right is that how yeah okay. yeah okay. yeah so right now if you became a member in 2016 you would be five years for this next camp uh right close yeah Next year, yeah. yeah, because it's a it it's a 2021 camp. Okay. So we're doing it in 2020, but the camp is not till 2021. So you will be five years at that point. So anybody that was uh, the key is this though, and I, I think I've had some folks not realize this. Um, we're not going to just automatically put all the people who've been in, you know, have been a member since 2016 or more into the camp. You have to actually register for the lottery, um, because if we did that, you know, we have we have 1,500 members around the world. And many, many of those have been around since way before 2016. So, you know, we, we would never be able to get anybody new in the camps if we did that. So, so. check, check your email and make, yeah, sure, make sure you, you sign up register. because I, because I think I did yeah. this one during a stressful time. I missed the registration and I'm like, Oh, that was so stupid. <laughs> but still the odds were very low. Now I will say this, you don't necessarily have to register to get credit. Yeah, exactly. You know, if yeah. you've been a member, so the problem is, though, we're not going to put you in the camp automatically unless you've registered unless you're for the lottery. That, that tells us you, we know you want to go. Exactly. You know? I, this is dangerous that I'm saying this now because now I'm going to get like 500 people next year <laughs> tell me they want to go. And yeah, uh, from Sweden I don't know if that's gonna, and Germany. I don't know what yeah. we do there. <laughs> Jeff having, and Dave would be really pissed off at me. Let's just say that. Well, you are having that camp in London next year too, right? So that when they can go to that one if they're in Europe, right? Oh no, it's not. not that's not us. No, <laughs> no I'm kidding. You, no, that's not. I think isn't that Aaron Franklin? Oh, they have their uh, yeah. Well, that's a different thing, right? They have a. I was just being facetious, but there is a thing. Oh. Like, no, there is something that there is, uh, but I think it's like it's a bunch of guys doing some kind of thing. Yeah, it's 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 not like what we do. They're they're doing some really cool stuff, but I, and I feel like it was it in the Netherlands or something like that. I don't remember exactly, but yeah. no, we've had other camps pop up. In fact, some of them with almost exact uh, copies of our our program. What? And we've we've asked them to you know you're gonna have to change your name at least do something. Because oh, we haven't, we've never really like, we've never really utilized the muscle that the collective uh, legal departments of UT and Texas A&M probably have. But we could. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's weird that <laughs> so, people would. But I guess there was supposed to be some festival. This was a year ago at Dodger Stadium that they had said, and they took and they said that all these different barbecue spots out here are going to be at, and they never called any of those places. They just they were just collecting money, I think, from like some kind of. Ooh. Yeah, a Kickstarter, <laughs> some kind of GoFund, wow. GoFundMe. Yeah, well, it, turned, it turned ugly real quick. That's that's pretty bad. Well, I I can tell you this: we've had one or two folks occasionally throughout the years tell us that we're a scam because they haven't been drawn in time that well, they wanted to be drawn in. Um, but I assure you, we are not. We have camps every year. It just we just don't get that many people in them. Yeah, well, and that's why that. we're doing this. So that it shows that it, it's just real. This is a real thing. There's a lot yeah. of it's yeah, a lot of details, a lot of nuance, and and hopefully everyone will get a chance eventually to do it. And that's the goal, yeah. you know. And, and, and we've gotten it. a lot of people through. Yeah, and it's and it's it's well. If you're just signing up just for that. 
portion just for the barbecue portion it's it's a really from i've again from afar it's an amazing experience and from everyone that i've interviewed that has kind of gone through the ranks that's like the russell regals and the different people that and the brought john brotherton that have been like early early days of, it's it's really neat yeah it's yeah it's it's a it's a fun event i mean i've seen it over and over and over again now but um, I every year get to see people who are just like blown away and, oh, yeah. and think it's the best thing that they've ever done. And I'm thinking, man, we did it better last year, you know, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, we're just we're constantly self critiquing. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's fun to watch people have just a really great experience. So well, well thank you for taking the time again and for jumping back in for the second part. Yeah, maybe we can check back in when we get some dates for symposium or something like that. So cool. And eventually quite- we'll do another barbecue symposium. We did one. Uh, in 2011, did you I think? No, maybe 2012, and it was well attended, and oh, it was a lot neat. of fun. Okay, yeah, you should do that. I'll keep bugging you then for that. You shouldn't have told me that. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we'll, we'll probably come back to it. I can't. What do we call it? Um, oh man, it was so clever. Do you want me to? Do you want me to keep that? Keep that? This part in there? Do people? I guess. Yeah, you're dangling a carrot out in front of people there. Well, here's the deal. We're usually talking about barbecue in some form. Mm-hmm. It, you know. Albeit, you know, maybe it's small piece of the symposium. It's hard to escape talking about barbecue yeah, in Texas, right? Yeah. Same, same with uh, anything having to do with Tex-Mex or tacos or something. We're usually talking about something like that as well. That makes sense. This next one that we do in person will be a little more focused on Mexican food, kind of writ large. I'm glad you're back in your house. That's nice. Thanks. I am too. I really, I'm, it's still, it's unfinished. I've got so many things to do still, but uh, it's nice to be back in the space and not way down South Austin at this point. So. Definitely.